Uh, 12.45, okay? All right, see you in a little bit. So uh, this is on page 507. It's uh, the lesson check for chapter 15, section three. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this on my paper and show you my document camera. So let's go ahead and go. Uh, looks like that. Looks like I got a little bit of sunlight popping out there. Hope you can just ignore that. We have lesson check. Uh, 15.3, that's on page 507. All right, what do we got? Uh, number 18. Oh, this is nice. There are, this is just like a reading understanding section. It's nothing, no major, you know, solving of problems like we typically do on this. So this should be a little bit quicker. How does a suspension differ from a solution? And I'm just looking at, on page 507, there's a table. I think that table probably sums up a lot of what is happening in, um, in this section. So how does the suspension differ from a solution? It's gotta have, it's gotta do something with the, with size. And, and if you look at the, uh, at the chart on page 507, it says that the, let's see, the particle type is the first one. In a suspension, the particle type is large particles or aggregates. So in a, in a, um, well, in a suspension, what you have is it, is that the particles, I'll write that, the particles are typically larger. Particles uh, are larger, and they're, they're a lot larger than, the, because you can actually see them. So particles are much larger. Whereas in a solution, you, you won't see, like your coffee, you don't see even grounds of coffee in there unless your coffee maker messed up. It just looks brown. Um, and then uh, as far as these, guy, these guys, uh, in your reading, it says something about the, in a suspension, where is it? Uh, they they kind of filter out um, and uh, they don't stay in the suspension for a long time. They'll, if, if it sits, it'll come out. Oh, there it is. On page 504, right before the key, right where the definition is, it says the suspension is a mixture from which particles settle out upon standing. So if you let it sit, it starts to, you start to see the, you know, the big particles at the bottom. So how should we say that? Um, they don't, uh, they don't stay uh, suspended. Eventually they'll come out. So you don't stay there for an indefinite amount of time, like, you know, like homogenated milk or, or even your coffee. If, well, you know, my, actually I should have, I should have saved it this morning, my coffee, was, uh, you know, when I got to the very bottom, there was some dark brown stuff at the bottom. So, you know, that stuff's coming out of uh, that uh, suspension there. So that's number 18. That's the answer to that one. Number 19, uh, what distinguishes a colloid um, from, from a suspension and a solution? And again, if you look at the table on page, page 507, you can see a comparison of, of all these different things but it really has to do with particle size. And so uh, colloidal, uh, colloids have, have particles that are smaller than, smaller than a suspension, but, but bigger than in solution. So it's kind of like the middle ground. Um, so colloids are, uh, we'll say that, colloids have particles that are smaller then uh, you get table 15 for then a suspension. But the larger uh, than in a solution, let's say. That's number 18, I'm number 19. 
colloids are particles smaller than suspension but larger than solution. Sounds good to me. All right, questions, comments on 1819? No? Did you get them both right so far? Yay, good deal. Okay, number 20. Um, number 20 says, how can you determine through observation that a mixture is a suspension? And that has to do with the settling. So um, if it's suspension, it'll settle out. If it's a mixture, it'll stay that way. So over, over a period of time, then you're, um, if it's a suspension, we'll say, if it's a suspension, the particles will come out and particles will settle, we'll say. Will settle out over a period of time. It might be, might be an hour, might be five minutes. It just, it just depends on, on many different things. Settle out, let's say over time. Might be a day. Depends on the on the suspension. All right, number 21, 20 and 20. Could you could you separate a colloid by filtering? Hmm. Well, it depends what you're using to filter. And uh, I would say that that some some colloids have or have their particles are small, but they might be smaller than, for example, uh, the filter in my coffee filter is uh, metal, but you can see the holes in it. And when you're doing this in the laboratory, sometimes you use a paper filter. And even with the paper filter, it won't happen quickly, but if it's a if it's a um, if it's a colloid, it'll come out through the paper. So um, uh, so uh, so what's the answer? The answer is if it's a if it's a um, if it's a colloid. Oh, it's a it's an it's a yes or no question, right? But that says explain. Could you separate a colloid by filtering? Let's say generally no, because the uh, the particles are too small or the particles are smaller than particles are smaller okay no the particles are smaller than the holes or the pores in the filter whether that's paper or a metal filter they won't you know it, It'll seem to plug it up a little bit and it won't flow like, like just water would, but, um, but eventually they all come through because the particles are smaller than the pores. All right, so that's number 21. Sometimes you get a clump that fills out those, plugged up those holes. Um, 22, how can the Tyndall effect be used to distinguish between a colloid and a solution? Well, remember the, the Tyndall effect has to do with light, right? So um, as you put the light through the colloidal suspension, you're going to see one thing, and, and the, the light scatters. That's uh, almost physics. Um, says on page 506, the scattering of visible light by colloidal suspension is called the Tyndall effect. So if you have the Tyndall effect, then what you can see is that, uh, is, well, what you can say is that you have a, a colloid. Um, normally, a light would go straight through, like if it was uh, just water, or if it was a solution, it would go straight through. Oh, and that's a question. How can the Tyndall effect be used to distinguish between a colloid and a, and a solution? Like if you had salt water um, and, the, and the salt was at a low concentration and you had light going through it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't get a, a kind of glowy kind of thing, but the, you would just have the light go through. And so that's a, that's a solution. But in a colloid, then it does get, it's kind of a, a cloudy kind of thing. And, and so uh, what did I just say and how should we write that? Um, so in a colloid, we'll say, we'll just say it like this. In a colloid, what you see is you see a, you can see a beam of light. You can see that haziness, um, but beam of light visible. 
we'll say. And if it was a suspension, just like water, if you shine a flashlight through there, you're, it's, you're not gonna see uh, kind of haziness, just the, what the light goes right through. <coughs> and so if you can see the light, then you have a colloidal suspension or colloid. All right, and then the last one, the last one says uh, relate cause and effect. Can the presence of a Brownian motion, or can the presence of Brownian motion distinguish between a, a solution and a colloid? Now remember Brownian motion is when they're, uh, when they're moving around uh, particles, um, whether they're molecules or atoms, they're gonna be moving around. And you increase the Brownian motion if you heat, heat up a system and you can cool down a system and decrease the Brownian motion. The Brownian motion has to do with collisions. So if, if you have, if you have more heat and, and the, uh, the particles are moving faster, then there's a greater chance, a higher percentage of time, they're gonna colli collide with each other. So that's the background. Can the presence of Brownian motion distinguish between a solution and a colloid? Huh. Um, let's see. When I used to work in a laboratory, we used to have a thing called a whatever it talked about this. Oh, in the, in the paragraph on page 506, it says flashes of light or skin lesions are seen when colloids are studied under the microscope. Um, colloid skin light because the particles reflect and scatter, uh, reflecting and scattering the light move erratically. Okay, so, um, so when you look at a colloid under a microscope, you'll see those. You see not the movement, you can't see the particle, but you can see, you, you can sense light coming out. Um, that's because the particles aren't moving all together, they're moving all over the place, they're moving um, kind of randomly, which is the definition of Brownian motion, it, it, it's a random movement. So um, the, the particles that, that are in solution, they're too small to be able to, uh, to for, for you to see that kind of effect, and so, since they're so small, they're doing it also. But since they're so small, they don't they don't cause that uh, that that uh, scintillation, that little flash of light. It's like a little. It's not even a second long. It's it's way less than a second long. But you can you can say, "Ooh, you ever see something in the corner of your eye, and you know something moved, and you but you weren't sure." Like for me, it was a bunny rabbit yesterday. I have a, we have a family of bunnies in the front yard and I thought I saw the bush move. And then I looked and then I saw a little teeny tiny tail. Um, but uh, you know, you sense it, but you don't even, you don't see it. And it's even you know, as fast as a bunny might be, you know, uh, that this is uh, even quicker. So that flash of light. So 23, can the presence of brand new motion distinguish between solution and its colloid? Um, so the answer is yes, um, because the Brownian motion, because of the larger particles, ooh, I'm getting it. So yeah, uh, call, because the colloids have larger particles. Uh, that will uh, will make that flash of light show up. Uh, so. Uh, yes, colloids have large particles that will skin light. light. So it'll spread out that light so you see those little flashes of light. Or maybe larger particles that will skin light the light. Um, and then the particles in a solution are too small to do that. In a solution are too small. To um, uh, too too small to uh, cause those little flashes of light. I'll say quick, not little, but they're quick flashes of light, which is called a scintillator or a scintillation, uh, or to scintillate. Uh, in the laboratory, we had a scintillator. And so what we measured daily was uh, the effect of uh, the chemical 
uh, that we were studying, we were studying all kinds of different chemicals that we were trying to figure out if they pass through rat lung lining. So I, my job was to take care of the rats and the frogs and then we'd pick one for today and then we'd stretch out the lungs and put them through, stretch it out over the, like the opening of this tube. And then you would pass chemicals through and then let's see, see how those chemicals uh, skinulate. And from that information, uh, hey, what's the neighbors? They're little. Um, from, from, uh, from that information, you can know whether that chemical passed through and how much of that chemical passed through from, from uh, one side of the lung to the other side of the lung. And that was back in the, I was in the 80s. You were still trying to figure out what chemicals pass through and what didn't. And so um, the stuff that, if, you know, if you're asthmatic or you know somebody who is, and uh, you know about albuterol and how uh, that's a chemical that's in, in, uh, in your inhaler, you know, you could know that it, it does, you know, some of these chemicals you want it to pass through the rat, uh, the the, uh, the lining of the of the rat lung, and some of them you don't. So sometimes they would add. Oh, hey, dog! Thank you. Sorry about that. So um, you uh, you would want to know you you would add another chemical to the the uh, the active chemical so that it was bigger so that it wouldn't pass through the lining or, you know, different things like that. Okay, so that is 15.3. So let me, let me uh, adjust the camera. And if you haven't been writing down and you just want to take a screenshot, here are the answers that, oh, too much light going in there, through there. Uh, that, those are the answers to 18 to 23 on page 507. 15.3. So again, take a screenshot if you want, um, or even get your phone out and take a picture if you want to do it that way. Um, that's uh, a pretty quick way to do it, but a better way to do it would probably be to go to control and switch switch window button around your F5 button and uh, and get it onto your computer directly. Then you can put it in your, um, your Google Drive. All right, so that's that. Any questions on 15.3? And I think that's the end of the chapter, isn't it? Ooh, that's the end of the chapter. So your PLT will.